What I hope will happen is that the true author will be, will be recognized. It is the greatest detective story there ever was. It's the greatest story in literature in my mind. And uh, you can't help getting absorbed in it and excited about it. And furthermore, you can't help feeling its importance. You want the man who uh, conferred the greatest glory on English letters to get his, his recognition. It's a matter of simple justice. Just after World War I, an English schoolmaster named J. Thomas Loney set out to find the real William Shakespeare by constructing an exact profile of his man, the way a detective might. There had been many candidates in the past, Christopher Marlowe, Francis Bacon, even Queen Elizabeth, but Loney was looking for someone new, a man of superb education and recognized genius, a man close to the royal court, and a man who had written under his own name before becoming Shakespeare. The search lasted several years. He came across this little volume of poetry here in the British Library. And in it, he found some poems which seemed remarkably similar to the works of Shakespeare. Framed in the front of forlorn hope, past all recovery, I stayless stand to abide the shock of shame and infamy. My life through lingering long is lodged in lair of loathsome ways. My death delayed to keep from life the harm of hapless days. My sprites, my heart, my wit and force in deep distress are drowned. The only loss of my good name is of these griefs the ground. The poems were by Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. At first it seemed that he had written only a few youthful poems, then stopped writing. And yet, literary critics of the period called de Vere one of the greatest Elizabethan poets, and the best for comedy. If he did write comedies and great poems, what happened to them? One of Loney's disciples came across a possible answer in another old book. This one, The Art of English Poesy, written in 1589. 13 years after De Vere supposedly put down his pen. It says, I know very many notable gentlemen in the court that have written commendably and suppressed it again, or else suffered it to be published without their own names to it. Of which number is first that noble gentleman, Edward, Earl of Oxford? Edward De Vere. Or else suffered it to be published without their own names to it. For Loney's disciples, this was a vital clue. Here they saw a nobleman who couldn't admit he was also a playwright, whose station in life meant that someone else would get the credit for the finest plays and poems in the language. When looking for who Shakespeare was, you're already dealing with a very small section of society, and there's inevitably a nobleman who were, had the best tutors of the day, who were edu well educated and so on. And the Earl of Oxford has all the academic and intellectual qualifications for being Shakespeare. If it was De Vere, if it was Edward De Vere, mm. why wouldn't he, he have owned up to it? Um, people don't seem to understand that, that if the Earl of Oxford died knowing that he would be recognized as Shakespeare in his time, he would have considered that a slur on his name and he would have known that his family would have been dishonored. Oxfordians believe that although their man couldn't acknowledge that he was the author, he left clues throughout the works. More than a hundred of the sonnets are written to the Earl of Southampton. Stratfordians say Southampton was Shakespeare's patron. But De Vere had a more definite tie. Southampton was also a ward of Lord Burley, and at one point almost married De Vere's daughter. Sonnet 125. Were it ought to me, I bore the canopy. To Oxfordians, the line makes sense, because De Vere did bear a golden canopy over Queen Elizabeth during celebration of the victory over the Spanish Armada. Several sonnets speak of old age and imminent death. De Vere was nearing death at the time the sonnets were written. Shakespeare was still in his thirties. Sonnet 76. Every word doth almost tell my name. A possible pun on the name E. Vere. For centuries, biographers have used the sonnets to light the dim past of the Stratford man. Now they're being used by Oxfordians to reveal an entirely different person. 
the Stratfordians would argue that it's like uh, it's like spontaneous generation. They are like the Christian fundamentalists who believe that life was created bang like that overnight, all complete as it is, just the way the plays of Shakespeare were completed bang in his brain without any background at all. How could anybody have thought that a man who could barely sign his name was the greatest writer in the English language, whom nobody while he was alive ever, to the best of our knowledge, ever identified as the dramatist Shakespeare, a dramatist of any kind or any kind of writer. I think that Oxford wanted his cousin, Horace or Horatio, to explain what his situation in life was, to explain that he wasn't the wastrel that he appeared on the surface, the spendthrift, spendthrift, the betrayer of his wife. He wasn't all the things that he's gone down as being, which were marginal with him. He wants Horatio to explain what he really was. Your name from hence immortal life shall have, though I, once gone, to all the world must die. I know what it cost him to write these plays. I know what it cost him to have to give up any hope of being acknowledged as the writer. Guys, you read the sonnets and you see it. Though I once gone to all the world must die. That's a tragic cry from a man. He saw himself as Lear, I'm sure. Not that his kingdom was lost. It, not that his kingdom was made over to his daughters, his literal kingdom, but that the kingdom in which he lived, his works were being alienated from him. He felt as Lear did. And for the first time in his life, I think, Oxford, this really quite haughty peer in some ways, was brought to feel the humanity, the common humanity with mankind that King Lear was brought to feel. And yes, I would like very much to see this man get the credit that's his due. As a person, I do, I do feel it, his presence as a person, yes. But I think he had a hell of a raw deal. Are there any particular lines in the poems or plays that you always look at in order to call this feeling of loss and sadness most clearly to mind? Well, I suppose the lines that, that do, uh, that make me realize that he had looked on, he had felt with utter despair, that he knew utter despair as probably no other human being who wrote as eloquently had ever felt. And those are the lines that Macbeth uttered when the news was brought to him of his queen's death. I don't think you need having them recited, you know what they are. And, uh, but they do, they, they affect me terribly when I hear them. Can you try to tell me what they are? I'll try to tell you what they are if my emotions don't get the better of me. Please remember, I've been awfully sick. But the lines are, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays... And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying, signifying nothing. nothing. Yes, I feel that very strongly. Excuse me. But I know how the man felt who wrote that, we all know how he felt. Black, utter despair that's never been so eloquently expressed before and probably never will again. So I like to turn to that, to other things he wrote. I don't like to dwell on it too much. But I, I can imagine how he felt, as Hamlet felt, as he was dying, pleading to his cousin to put his cause or right to the unsatisfied. I'd like to help do that. I shall live your epitaph to make, or you survive when I in earth am rotten. From hence your memory death cannot take, although in me each part will be forgotten. 
Your name from hence immortal life shall have, though I, once gone, to all the world must die. The earth can yield me but a common grave, when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie. Your monument shall be my gentle verse, which eyes not yet created shall o'er-read, and tongues to be your being shall rehearse. When all the breathers of this world are dead, you still shall live, such virtue hath my pen, where breath most breathes, even in the mouths of men.